and we we encountered this elderly man. Um, he had like a trilby, he was about five foot four, and he had a little Jack Russell dog. And we said, have you ever seen the ghost house? And he said, well, I've seen it twice. Unexplained Cases is supported by the American Paranormal Press. Carrie Nyan. and Cullen Therapies. There is something unworldly going on in the northeast of England. After a few days of exploring London's paranormal highlights, I hopped on a train from St Pancras Station, and before long I was in the town of Bury St Edmunds. The town is located in the ancient county of Suffolk, whose history is littered with stories of spectral monks appearing to startled eyewitnesses, witchcraft, and rumours of an energy superhighway of ley lines. The town's namesake abbey attracts ghost hunters from far and wide. I started my investigation by walking around the town's cobbled streets and in the ruins of the abbey that was the centre of monastic society in years gone by. While tales of phantom monks and headless horsemen dominate, the bizarre case of an entire spectral house that haunts a nearby small village called Ruffham is something truly extraordinary. The ghostly phenomenon of a Georgian-style mansion that appears in an empty field near Ruffham has been reported by at least 20 people over the last 150 years. Explanations for the mirage encompass time slips, dimensional rips, and the stone tape theory. When the opportunity arose for me to investigate this unique and frankly baffling mystery, I met up with Simon Nunn, a documentary filmmaker who is currently collating eyewitness sightings. I interviewed a key witness and soaked up the mysterious energy that seems to cloak the towns of England's northeast. Being a bit of a ghost geek, on the way to Ruffham I persuaded my host to swing by the airy church of Bradfield St George, where local legend says a hooded monk from centuries past can sometimes be seen amongst the gravestones buried in the long grass. The church itself was suitably spooky, and even came complete with gargoyles and a gurney used to ferry the dead. With the atmosphere heightened, we headed to the source of the rough and disappearing house phenomenon, a nondescript wheat field bordered by a tree-lined area known as Colville's Grove. My local guides inform me Christian Martyr and Berry St Edmund's namesake Edmund the Martyr may have met his end, killed somewhere close by in the 9th century by the marauding great heathen army. Edmund's remains were translated from an unidentified location in East Anglia to modern-day Bury St Edmunds. However, this is open to debate, but the location of the mysterious field at Ruffham is on the aptly named Kings Hall Street. We entered the area adjacent to Corville's Grove and made our way through the field where the apparition is said to appear. Eyewitnesses from all walks of life over the past century and a half have reported seeing a grand red brick Georgian style mansion highlighted sometimes by white pillars sitting in the field and on the eyewitnesses return the house has simply vanished into thin air. The accounts of the apparition are remarkable for their consistency and have been seen by people as diverse as local villagers to tourists. A large power pylon sits smack bang in the middle of the field possibly advancing a theory that electricity is needed for replays of the past to manifest into this dimension. An account by a local oral historian of him being startled by an ominous noisy whirlwind or vortex-like thing while metal detecting the site some years ago propagated this theory. A 20th century account of the mirage tells of eyewitnesses hearing a whooshing-like sound before the house manifested in front of them. I must admit to having some trepidation upon entering Colville's Grove, a sinister looking wood in the past used by a group of modern druids and today frequented by people from a local traveller camp who tell stories of mysterious goings on. Ryan, who was accompanying us on the trip, told a story of seeing mysterious lights in the wood while on an overnight investigation with Simon. A local rumour tells that a man who lives across the road from the field used red bricks that he sourced from the grove to lay out his driveway. Could the red bricks have been evidence that a house once stood on the site? Frustratingly, local records show no evidence such a structure existed, at least not during the period of Georgian architecture. 
Halls of trees in the grove have been suggested by some as avenues leading to a formerly opulent estate. Ruffin researcher Carl Grove, who has produced a definitive guide to the mystery, said that there could be no doubt about the tree's significance. Nobody would consider planting two substantial avenues of trees leading to a piece of derelict woodland. There must at one time have been a large building at the location, wrote Carl. After making our way into the grove and fending past bracken, nettle and bramble, which was intent on snagging our clothes, it was remarked how quiet and bereft of birds and animal life the woods seemed. It's eerily quiet though, isn't it? On examining the claims of an avenue of trees lining the grove that may or may not have once led to a grand estate, some symmetry was observed. Poplars were interspersed with several oak trees that seemed to form an irregular pattern. Aside from the bones of a couple of dead badgers and a field full of ominous sounding crows, we experienced no time slips, clamorous vortexes or apparitions of a mansion house, much to our disdain. Jean Bertram claims to have seen the Ruffer Mirage in 2007. Jean is in her 80s, lives locally, and has the distinction of being the only recorded eyewitness of the house being seen on the opposite side of Kings Hall Street. Here's what Jean had to say about her experience. Night husband and I were, it was a Sunday afternoon, a bit like this, the weather, yep. quite windy, cold, cold in April. And I said, shall we get, the car stood there. I said, well, shall we go for a ride around some of the other villages? Because there's nothing much on telly, so. And we went, and we, we came into Ruffin, and we were going up a, a road called Kings Hall Street, and we came to the last bungalow on the left. And there was a, a, a field, all freshly harrowed, this great big house standing in the middle, very bright and sort of grand, quite grand. And, um, I just said to Johnny, um, look at that lovely house down there. He went like that and glanced. He said, I can't look now because I'm coming up to the junction. And I didn't think any more about it much. And we went on to the other villages where we were going, one called Felsham and all out that way. And coming back, the house was gone because I was looking for it and it wasn't there. You you came back the same way? Oh, yeah, I had questioned that. Yeah. And I said, are we on the same road as we came? He said, yes, that's the only way out. I saw there's a great big new house standing there, and I wanted to have another look at it. He said, oh, you're just seeing things, you know. I said, well, I did see it. <laughs> and I left it at that, and I kept wondering. I thought, when I got back here, I thought, well, there was no way into it. There was no gate, nothing. And it looked new built, I thought. Anyway, I didn't say anything much to anybody because I thought, well, they'll think, think I'm silly. And I knew I'd seen it. Mm. <laughs> Definitely knew I'd seen it. Had you travelled that way never. plenty of times? And no, it was the never, first time? I've never been up that road before. Okay. And I'd never heard of the Ruffin House. Yep. Never heard of the Ghost House, which it must be. <laughs> and, um,. Julie came with me one day because yeah. one of her neighbours had a cat at the cattery there, mum and daughter cat, and um, was it the mummy went well, away? What had happened is they, they'd taken it to a cattery mm -hmm. um, nearby, mm -hmm. um, Ruffham, and one of them had escaped, and so I was putting up posters all around Ruffham to try mm -hmm. and find the cat, and we, we encountered this elderly man um, he had like a trilby, he was about five foot four, and he had a little Jack Russell dog. And we said, have you ever seen the ghost house? And he said, well, I've seen it twice. <laughs> yeah, he said, I've only so, seen it twice. I said, yeah. twice? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Not people have never seen it at all. Yeah. So it was got more of a mystery then than he mm. spoke. Yeah. Had you heard of the phenomenon, for lack of a better term, before your sighting? Oh, there's nothing about it, whatever. No. Yeah. Only what about local chatter and stuff? Did, did did you know anyone who had or was aware of it? No, I'd never heard of it at all. Nothing, mm. Absolutely nothing. And um, then I was told a few things. The last bungalow on the left up King's Hall Street. And um, I was told a lady used to sit in her little conservatory knitting in the evenings. 
and she'd seen monks walking up and down the tracks where the wood is behind the so-called house. And, uh, where they would have transported the, the forest wood to, to bury, yeah, does that, that sound right? Yeah, yeah, they used to bring up the horse and cart, she said. Well, the story went from who used to live there about that, you see. And um, take to the Berry, Berry St Edmunds, um, the old Abbey Gardens when that was going. They used to take the wood there on the horse and cart. They were always in the woods getting whipped wood. Yeah, quite grand it looked, what we saw of it. Mm. And another man from Honiton in the Air Force, he, he saw it apparently. And he hurried home to get his wife to show her. <laughs> yeah. when they got back. There's been a few people saying that, hasn't there? Yeah. yeah, it's all going back years, apparently. Oh, it is, we, years. Mm, we've, we've managed to uh, track down about 25 people. Really? Mm, yeah. Which is a lot. Yeah, that is a lot. Um, mm. And over, for at least the past 150 years, there has mm. been documented in newspapers. Yeah, and stuff. What period would you date the house from, if you had to guess? I don't know, because it looks so new. It looks it really looked new. new. Yeah. Really grand. There's gold showing on it. There were all these long windows. Not quite as long as the picture in the paper. Mm -hmm. It was more square. Like Georgian. Yeah. Really and they had a, a long piece of um, up the top, about four pillars. Mm. So I didn't know it was a ghost house. But anyway, um, when we were coming home with the schoolmaster, Ali, my son, and me, we went a different way out of Rotham that I've never been before. And in the corner of a, a field, I don't know what the field was, but it was all grass. There, but there was a big grass mound right up the corner of this field. And I think Ali, my son, said they opened it up several years ago and there was a lead coffin in it. And there was the name of an emperor on it. They had to put it all back and cover it up again. So I don't, there's some history there somewhere. And emperors were before kings, obviously. Mm. Well, that goes with the old house and the, the monks and the mm. abbey. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to get you know to the bottom of it all. <laughs> Sadly, my time in Ruffin was at an end, and after being charmed by Jean and her story, and visiting Colville's Grove, the scene of all the action, I couldn't help but think the apparition of a house, as bizarre as that sounds, could have some truth to it. Whilst not claiming to have applied the scientific method to my pseudo-investigation, the sheer number of eyewitnesses, many of whom are unconnected, does give some plausibility to this mystery. Hopefully I can return in the future and commit more time to interviewing eyewitnesses, examining contemporary sightings, and even trawling through old newspaper clippings. The burden of proof in any paranormal investigation remains with the researcher. My colleague Simon Nunn is looking forward to setting up trail cameras at the Ruffham site in the hope of capturing a manifestation from another dimension. In an age where everyone has a cell phone in their pocket, poised to capture life's unusual events, proof of the rougher mirage may lie with someone simply being in the right place at the right time. For Unexplained Cases, I'm Jim Birchall.